Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, welcome to Vancouver. And on behalf of Canada Health Infoway, uh, delighted to be able to welcome everyone uh, to the 2015 Partnership Conference. Um, and those for, for those of you from out of town, we should have a couple of really nice sunny days, I think, so you should uh, enjoy the view out of these, uh, maybe the windows on one side or the other anyways. Uh, so my name is Jim Michelson. I'm Canada Health Infoway's Executive Director for Western Canada, uh, based here in Vancouver. Uh, and so as a local Vancouver guy, the uh, organizing committee asked me to say a few opening remarks. Uh, also joined here this morning uh, by Dr. Daryl Samuel, the Chief Medical Information Officer for um, Fraser Health, yes, and the co-chair of the Standing Committee on Information Management and Information Technology in BC. Uh, so Daryl will have the uh, opportunity to provide a little more thought-provoking remarks up here this morning uh, in advance of our keynote speaker. I get to do the housekeeping stuff. So, uh, the uh, theme for this year's conference, or, or, or the, uh, the, is this year's conference is emphasizing clinical interoperability for better health, get connected. Um, so in looking through the conference agenda, I think we have a great lineup of leading influencers, implementers, and adopters that will share both their experiences and their visions for achieving the value of digital health solutions through interoperability. And we also have plenty of opportunity for you to get connected to other attendees and expand your own opportunities to achieve value through the connections you make here. So I'd like to thank uh, Jim for inviting me here today to help welcome you to the InfoWay Partnership Conference. As you know, InfoWay's purpose is to realize the vision of healthier Canadians through innovative digital health solutions. And the presentations and sessions we have ahead of us today look to be both exciting and informative. Here in British Columbia, as co-chair of the Standing Committee on Health Information Management and Information Technology, I'd like to share with you a brief outline of our provincial enabling strategy our strategic framework will provide support for primary and community rural and surgical services as outlined in the Ministry's Strategic and Operations paper, setting priorities for the BC Health System. Our objectives are to establish a sector-wide health information exchange, improve data sharing for decision support, and focus on patient-centered information and technology. And our strategy includes improved clinical systems integration, shared care planning, surgical booking, and telehealth expansion. To achieve these objectives, we are embarking on the creation of health information standards for the province and driving toward a shared IMIT services model. We're developing a common and shared interest policy and a resourcing framework with integrated planning cycles across the health sector. And I'm happy to say that we've benefited from InfoWay's support in our journey so far in British Columbia. One of the most recent examples we have is the Health Authority Integration with PharmaNet project that is on its way, providing technology-enabled medication reconciliation. And you will hear more about that later today. And we look forward to further collaborative innovation on digital health solutions with InfoWay in the future. We know that we have to connect our health information systems across the continuum of care in a way that provides value. But simply connecting digital health solutions and increasing the amount of data available is only half of the job. Just like alert fatigue, Information overload is a real risk. And we will soon start being overwhelmed with data. So we need to create a system of digital knowledge that combines the use of data analysis, peer-reviewed research, and evidence-informed practice. A system that will put organized and sorted information into the hands of our frontline clinicians in real time so they can provide truly up-to-date and patient-centered care in their clinical practices. The larger benefits of digital tools in healthcare will only be realized when we start to build and organize systems to get the relevant and value-added big data into the hands of our providers and patients. And to show you what this might look like from the clinician and patient perspective, 
I have a brief animation that suggests how information management and information technology may improve our healthcare system if we build it with this vision. So you want to become like a hundred years old. Yeah. Of course, that means you need to stay super healthy. And that's where your doctor comes in. You know, checking your vital signs, giving you the best medicine, and uh, perhaps helping you walk again. Great, yeah. right? But to help you even better, she also has to know how other doctors treat their patients. Right now, she has to read a lot of studies. There are so many, it would take up to 14 hours a day just to read the new ones. And those are even outdated because it takes years to collect the data. Wouldn't it be awesome if your doctor could connect to the healthcare data of 4.6 million people? That's like everybody in British Columbia. Yeah, this is possible with a health information exchange. Every action doctors take, together with the status of their patients, goes into their computer. And those so-called order sets can all be connected. With the anonymous data from all these actions, your doctor will be able to see what other doctors did thousands and thousands of times before them. And she'll immediately see when one of them starts something new that works even better. So now, she knows exactly when to check your vital signs, gives you the perfect amount of medicine, and tomorrow, you might even run a marathon. That's how you will become super healthy and maybe even over a hundred years old. So it's hard to read the print at the end, but it says start connecting health information to make British Columbians healthier. Thank you and enjoy the conference. So um, first of all, I want to thank InfoWay for inviting me here today. Um, it's been an exciting time to have an opportunity to um, speak with some of you earlier this morning at breakfast and understand your model of, of delivery. And I'm going to speak mostly today from the model in Cleveland, uh, but we have been doing development around the world. We have an operation that uh, is in full production now in Abu Dhabi, and on my way back from there, we sto I stopped to take a look at our next site, which will be in London. So it's, uh, I'm getting a little comparative history around uh, healthcare delivery. And so what I wanted to do today was to focus my conversation on things that I think are common across all systems. And that really is the challenge that we face today around delivering great quality care and doing it in a cost effective way. And I think if we stay focused on that, it's something that we all share. And I think we can also see uh, the real opportunity that health information technology brings particularly. And then in this talk, I'm hoping that you will also see the value of interoperability in, in allowing us to meet that promise. So really three things today. Uh, first is a quick framework around our sort of cost challenges. Second one is to talk about the tools that I think are gonna be necessary to deliver and, and meet the challenge that we've talked about. And then the third one is a story that sort of ties it together and I think brings the value of interoperability alive. So about five years ago, we had the um, honor of hosting the President of the United States at the Cleveland Clinic. And at that time, the conversation really was about the period that we're in right now. Uh, so this was the start of the Affordable Care Act in the United States. The goal was to bring another 30 million people into the healthcare system. We're about a third of the way through that process right now. But this conversation was focused on the idea that once they're in the system, if they were in the same delivery model that we had, what we knew for sure is that the costs for healthcare in the United States were going to go up. And so this conversation was around how can we in fact deliver on the promise of, deliver, of uh, giving great care to patients but doing it in a value-based way that made it affordable uh, for everyone. So if you're going to use that as your, your charge, the very first thing you need to do is to focus in on quality. And we were having conversations about how we could make that demonstrable, uh, because if you don't stay focused on quality, you can make anything less expensive, which is not what patients really want. What they really want is great quality care uh, but they want it in an affordable way. The second thing is it needs to be absolutely safe and reliable. So if you do something well once every 10 times, 
uh, that's not something that patients are looking for either. So we talked a lot about what does it mean to make a safe, reliable delivery organization over time. The third one was a, a long conversation around care coordination. And this conversation envisioned a different way of actually delivering the care. And it meant that people may not be in the same room or in the same building or even on the same campus, but what they will be doing is caring for the same patient no matter where they are. And then finally, we talked about the fact that we had to do all of these things and do it in a cost-effective way. So that's the framework for the rest of my conversation here. And what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about how we can accomplish these things. And I'm going to use the Cleveland Clinic Cleveland as a, as a model for how we can deploy these tools and begin to think about transforming the way we deliver care. So for those of you who don't know uh, the Cleveland Clinic, it is a physician group practice. There are about 3,000 physicians and scientists there, all employed in a single model. Uh, there is a main campus hospital. It now has about 1,400 beds. It has the highest case mix index in the country um, uh, at this point. And the, the original organization was founded in 1921. Over time, we began to grow the organization, and the population began to diffuse out of the, the central portion of Cleveland. And so we had to distribute the delivery system, but we wanted to maintain the idea of the Cleveland Clinic, which is it is a group practice, clinicians working together for the benefit of their patients, uh, but now we had to accomplish it over a much broader geographic area, and we had to have multiple inpatient units rather than just a single campus. So to that end, we built out this series of uh, health system hospitals uh, that are all part of one enterprise. And you can see the volume statistics there at the bottom. So physically, it kind of looks like this. The dark blue is the Great Lake uh, that's just above us. And then the main campus, which is about a 90-acre facility um, right at the uh, eastern portion of, of Cleveland, has that 1,400-bed hospital on it and probably has about 65% of all of the physicians. Predominantly, the subspecialty physicians are practicing on that main campus. These red dots are what we call family health centers. They include a combination of primary care practitioners uh, as well as subspecialists, but uh, physically located where the population was moving. And then these blue dots are those hospitals that I just talked about that are spread across. So if you go from the far right edge to the left edge of, of the screen, you're talking about 100 miles. Now there are a couple of exceptions down there in the right hand corner, that blue dot is actually in Florida, so it's 1,500 miles away. And on the left-hand side for me, uh, there's the Las Vegas operation. And then we do have a very small ambulatory practice that's actually in downtown Toronto, Canada as well. Um, the Abu Dhabi operation uh, uses the same model. So it's Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. It's an employed physician group practice. It's an integrated practice and hospital structure there. Uh, we manage the C-suite. So I have a CIO um, there. We manage the hiring and firing of all doctors and nurses, although technically we don't employ them in a foreign country. And then we manage all of the information systems uh, in, that op in that facility as well. So it is essentially the same model as the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and we're driving to the same purpose, but we don't share information uh, across the 8,000 miles, primarily because of uh, legal issues um, in the country. So that's the structure of the Cleveland Clinic. Now what I wanted to do is talk about the tools for delivering on those promises that I started with. And when I think about it, we tend to talk a lot about either EHR or EMR, and I'm not sure what the full set is, and I'm not sure I know what the best descriptor of everything we're going to need is, but what you see here is a series of tools that we have developed in order to begin to address the promise of delivering great care to our patients no matter where they are. 
So at the height of the dot-com craze about uh, 13, 15 years ago, we really thought about what is, and when everyone was thinking about what is your internet strategy, we decided that content was not our strategy. We have a lot of content online, but really care was going to be our strategy around the internet. The other thing we really decided is that we didn't want an IT strategy, but rather we wanted a patient care strategy that IT supported going forward. So as we thought about it that way, we knew that we were going to need a collection of technology tools and services in order to deliver care to patients who were spreading out across Northeast Ohio and across the United States and across the world. So E Cleveland Clinic became the model for thinking about that, the place where we could think about both care and technology as one. The practice of medicine was our focus, and delivering great care to patients was the promise that we were looking to meet. So as we thought about it, we built out a series of tools, and these are only some of them, primarily focused on the provider side and the patient side. And I'm just going to walk you through quickly and kind of level set. And as I said, I'll end by tying this together through a story, which I think will show you why interoperability is so important and why it's really ultimately key to delivering on the promise of transforming where and when we deliver care. So the first one is the one that we talk about the most in the United States, and it's either the electronic medical record or the electronic health record. Uh, we've been at it in the country for a while. You know there's been a national meaningful use program. Uh, we started on this path in about 2001 uh, for our enterprise. So the scale of it is we had a couple of principles. The first one was we did not want to be in the software development business. So that was an opening principle for us. Uh, we wanted a partner who could help us drive that forward without having to have a software development shop. We were prepared to do development at the edge. So I call the core stra the strategy the core information strategy, and we develop as we need at the edge of it. Uh, but most importantly, we wanted a single database for everything. Inpatient, outpatient, emergency room oncology. We wanted it in all, all in one place, and that was our sort of opening technology principle. The second thing is when we defined the practice of medicine, we had a very broad definition of that. So we include registrars, schedulers, nurses, doctors, medical students, fellows, everyone is a user in, in our institution of the electronic medical record. My practice is the acronym that we've used to internally brand the system. That's the name that everyone knows. No one knows the vendor's name uh, at this point. So it is about the practice of medicine uh, and that's the core tool. And all of these people, we call all of the employees at the Cleveland Clinic caregivers. And our caregivers who are focused on um, delivering any service to patient use this tool in some way uh, in carrying out their work. So the next thing then is sort of scale. So I mentioned we employ 3,000 physicians, but in those blue dots that you saw, any privately practicing physician who can get admitting privileges can practice in that hospital. So that explains the other 4,600 that you see here. But if you practice in one of those blue dots, you are required to use the information system in caring for the patients. Because for us, it doesn't matter whether you're employed or not. We are really focused on how we manage the information uh, around caring for those patients. All residents and fellows and medical students from the day they walk in uh, get a essentially trainee's license and it changes. If you're a medical student, you can write some things. You can't order anything at all uh, in the system. If you're a resident or fellow, you can order some things that may require co-signing. And if you're a postgraduate fellow, then you can write like an attending. Every day at about 10.30, we hit the peak for the day. It goes from 10.30 to 2.30. 16,000 people hit the inner key at exactly the same time. Uh, this is about the practice of medicine for us. We would not be able to operate if this is not operating. Um, so you get a sense of the scale of it. You can see where the 
um, transactions per day are coming from, the millions of transactions that are happening um, uh, uh, through the system. So from a functionality point of view, just very high level, ambulatory for us, this is the list of the core capabilities that we use. So doctors can talk to one another and it won't be part of the medical record, or if they choose, they can make it part of the medical record. Um, so you can trade your baseball tickets, uh, but if you're really gonna do something around a patient, then it's gonna be filed into the medical record. The schedule is the schedule, and this is why we included um, and have our schedulers using this tool. Scheduling is a real-time event. Scheduling supports a lot of decision support activity uh, in, across our enterprise. So it is used by doctors, nurses, patients, everyone. It's a core and fundamental tool for us. Results are results. We don't think inpatient results. We don't think outpatient results. They are just ordered. They're, they're uh, available in reverse chronologic order. You can see the detail. Where did that result come from? How, what laboratory did, did, uh, did it happen in? What's the time? The result, you can see all of that. But fundamentally, clinically, it's presented as one big grouping. Uh, documentation has been the great journey for us. So we have been... Um, really going from thinking about handwriting notes. Uh, we converted a long time ago away from that, and so the first step was get it in, get it in any way you can. So type it in, we provided dictation, we used templates to start. Um, now we're on the other side of that curve, so think about a decade. We are primarily focused on structured value-added documentation, but that's meaningful to the clinician. So if you do the work, you should be able to better understand your practice as a result of it, and you should be able to compare your practice to the other people in your group. Now, we have a transparency um, model at the Cleveland Clinic. So as we co collect this information, we share it across all of our physicians, um, and it is not limited to your specialty. So you can go through, I'm a general internist, but if I wanted to see how the cardiac surgeons are working, I can go online, I can see their activity, I can see the mortality rate, I can see their compliance with care path activity, I can see all of that at the group level, and I can see it at a numbered individual level. I don't know the name of the individual at that point in time, but I can get all the way down to that level through these systems, uh, and we are using that information for, to drive continuous improvement. It is physician order entry everywhere, inpatient, outpatient, ED, oncology, orders are entered by licensed professionals, the vast majority of which are the 3,000 practicing physicians. Best practice alerts are driven to support that practice going forward. And then the last thing I would say is imaging to us is absolutely critical. So our goal was to make imaging available to physicians without them having to understand how it works. So we had a parallel strategy, I'll come back and talk about it. Inpatient, same system, same database, more detail. So I know where the patient is in a bed, same results that I would see on the ambulatory side, the interface is uh, grossly the same, so navigation is the same, a lot more detail on the inpatient side a lot more detail about medications and vital signs, documentation tools are similar, same computerized physician order entry, same imaging system when you're on the inpatient side. So just gonna say a few words. This is the journey of documentation. Um, and so what you're seeing here now is that in our care path model, it's all structured. So um, we have, uh, we're, We'll have seven of them done this year and we'll add another 10 next year. If you are using these models, you are, you're doing very little freeform typing. All of this has been designed by the specialist uh, and the allied health professionals who work with them to drive that process. It's integrated so that any one person who enters the information who's qualified makes it available for the next clinician so that they don't have to re-enter the information. Uh, takes a lot of work and a lot of trust to get to that point. 
Um, on the imaging side, we saw very early on, two to three years, that we were going to be inundated by images and that we were going to have 20 or 30 systems around image management if we didn't do something about it. So what we decided was to have a parallel strategy. I think of it as the EMR for imaging. And what we're really doing here is hiding all of the back-end systems from the physician and making it appear as if it's part of our core EHR. So for them, they have no idea what the name of those systems are. They basically see two tabs, one that's directly related to the result, like here. So you might read the text of the result. When you get to the bottom, you click on a button and you see the image in that context. So if this were a patient with a pneumonia, you can go over to that left-hand column Pick, the, pick medications and order the antibiotic while you're still looking at the x-ray. To them, it appears to be inside of the EMR. Now, you can make an image bigger if you want and cover the whole screen, but it just goes up, it goes down, but you're never taken out of the EMR, and the context is managed with that patient. So if you close the x-ray, close the patient's record, that x-ray is going to go away. You won't have an x-ray that's free-floating uh, in front of you. So that set of tools, that core tool, is what allowed us to do that. So we want to practice as a group. So we may have a physician in one of the red dots, a different physician in the blue dot, a different physician in the square that's downtown, taking care of a patient. They are a team related to that patient's care and information technology is the way we make that happen. So we have e-enabled the enterprise at this point in time. Uh, there are a total of seven million patients uh, in this facility. And if we were to add another hospital, there would be no choice. We would simply, they would go on to this system. But that's not really a strategy for transforming the practice in and of itself that as we thought about it, we knew that that was the floor, but we were going to need more. Uh, one of the things we did was to think about the patient at the same time we were thinking about the provider. So we knew that we needed to actively engage patients. We wanted to build a tool to make that happen. So for us, that tool is called MyChart. Uh, it is directly connected to that same EHR. It uses the same database. It's not a separate tool. It doesn't copy anything. It's web enabled, so it's got all of that security associated with it. But that is the principal tool that we are using. At this point, we have about a million patients who have an access code for the tool. Um, and then we have about 700,000 patients who I would consider active users uh, of the tool going forward. So what is my chart? It gives the patient access to the same real medical information, lab results and the like. So we have an open medical records policy. That has been a journey. We didn't do it on day one. Uh, but now lab results go to the patient within 36 hours of being finalized. As a physician, if I release it immediately, it will go immediately to the patient. They see all their labs. They see the text from the radiologist, the text from the pathologist. They see my progress note when I sign it immediately, no delay uh, for it. They see their hospital discharge in full. They can, while they're in a hospital bed, see their medical record from the bed on a device that we make available to them as well. So our goal is to make this their chart from which they can get all of this information. So health reminders on the patient side is the same thing as a best practice alert on the physician side, just turn the other way around. It's time for your screening, you get a notice who's the most motivated individual to make sure that it happens on time, the patient, tell the patient they can drive that. We reverse it, so we have approved functions for patients. So if you need a mammogram, that's an approved function. It knows your age, it knows your gender, it knows the last time you had to study, it knows whether it's appropriate or not. So the patient can book that appointment for the mammogram. They don't need to wait and we do the ordering in reverse, it shows up in my inbox, and essentially I'm approving it um, after the fact. 
patients see their schedules online uh, today, uh, and now we have opened the schedule to real online appointment scheduling. So not an appointment request. We're doing it only for primary care. We're doing it very cautiously at this point in time. But what you can do is from your mobile phone as a patient who has this service, pull your phone out, open it up, pick your physician. It'll show you a slot. You pick Monday morning, Tuesday afternoon, Thursday morning. Those are the options I want. Hit the search button. It will bring the appointments that um, comply with that. You pick the appointment and book it. It's confirmed at that moment. You never talk to a person in that process. So we're good on the primary care side. Our expectation next year is we will book somewhere between 400 and 450,000 appointments that way. That represents about 40 FTEs to do that. We have a central phone call system. Uh, we are looking to use those resources uh, to better purposes going forward. Um, so prescription renewal is something a patient can do online here. So they, if they, uh, prescriptions expire in the states and so you can uh, renew the prescription without calling the office. And then the last thing is we knew that it, it was never going to stay online. So very early on, we went to this phone-based model. Just like most apps, there are certain things you can do here. So you can literally book your appointment here. Uh, but there are some features that you can't do over the phone that you would have to do on the web. Mostly consent forms and survey tools and those kinds of things that are a little, the more elaborate ones can't be done through this model today. So again, this is the scale of it. It is the standard of practice for us. This slide's a little bit dated. Um, so when you come into the institution now, our assumption is you will be a MyChart user. The first time you go to check in, you will be handed an access code. Now as a patient, you can choose to decline it, and about 8% of our patients do decline it for one reason or another, don't have internet access, don't want the service. That number has been dropping in the last five years. It was as high as 17, 18%, and now we're at the seven or 8% level. So our assumption and what we tell our patients is if we're gonna deliver the best care to you, this is a tool that's very important for you and your clinician. So the next thing we thought about is staying on the patient side, what else could we do in a responsible way? And this was one of our earliest products than thinking about leveraging the internet. And we were receiving lots of requests for second opinions. And we got them in every way you could imagine. Faxed, emailed, shipped in by paper, literally cart and boxes of things with a request of tell me what you think. So no physician identified, I just want your opinion. Uh, and we were literally servicing those things in a hundred different ways across the enterprise. So we decided that that could be improved. So we moved to the online model, we call it my consult. So it is an online second opinion, so that's the key. So we limit it to you must have a primary diagnosis, um, from a clinician who's caring for you. Now what patients are really looking for are those last two things. Confirmation of the diagnosis that was originally given, and then are there any treatment alternatives that I should be aware of are the principal request coming through the system. So it truly is online, it is truly for any patient anywhere, but this is a part of the development side that I told you about. So this is not part of the core EHR system. Uh, it was critical to our practice to be able to do it, so we were willing to build this at the edge, but it is tied directly to that EHR. So the development part is for the patient. The physician practices the exact same way in the EMR as if the patient were there. So the patient goes online, finds the site, uh, they enter that primary diagnosis, it then delivers a series of questions defined by the subspecialist who's going to render the consult, that group of subspecialists. They answer those questions and then the system tells them exactly what they have to collect if they want a full consultation. Now today this is the semi-automated part, so they do all that online. 
but then they're going to package up some things, usually imaging studies, pathology results. This thing prints out an express mail label. They take that, put it on anything. They send it through the service that they choose. Could, in the States, it would be FedEx or, or UPSS. And they would, uh, it will make its way to the Cleveland Clinic. When it comes in, it goes to a unit that's in that eCleveland Clinic function that was mentioned that I, I manage. There's a series of nurses in that room. They open the package, they go online, they match it up, and then they create what we call the pizza box. So the pizza box is everything that subspecialist needs to render the second opinion is in that box or labeled to the online piece of it. Um, it gets delivered through an appointment. So the physician is upstairs, room to room to room. They go into the next room, no patient, pizza box. If they see the pizza box, they know they can do the consultation. They open the box, but most importantly, they go into the EMR and they render their opinion in the EMR just as if that patient were sitting in the chair. Uh, so we don't want to change the practice of the physician as we go. Once they render their um, um, opinion, it's in the EMR, it gets picked up and then delivered back through the system as a full annotated consultation to the patient. And then the last thing we did was to reverse the process. So we don't call the patient first, we give them 48 hours. They get a chance to read this, they get a chance to click on the links, they get the chance to read that material. Uh, and then at the end of the 48 hours, we call and talk to the patient. I can tell you, I do, I'm a general internist, but I do mostly preoperative evaluation. So I see patients who choose to fly in. And I can tell you in the first five minutes, uh, they either didn't bring the right information, they're not exactly sure why they're there, they certainly don't have the right appointments, and then the fire drill starts. This is around the other way. By the time you're talking to the patient, they are as educated as they can be and you're on a much more level playing field, so the number of questions and the kinds of questions you get are fewer and far more effective in terms of communicating with that patient. When I do it at the end of someone physically being there, I can talk to them, look in their eyes, and it's very clear to me that they're hearing about 25% of what I have to say. So this is our broadest system. It operates around the globe today. Uh, you do not need to be a Cleveland Clinic patient, but once you are in the system, you are a Cleveland Clinic patient. You have the same identifier as a person who walked through the door, and if you came a year later or five years later, they would find you in the system. You already exist. Now, I'm going to go a little bit faster because I want to leave some time here for some conversation. So other tools, tools for other providers, so we were thinking about not all doctors are employed by the Cleveland Clinic, yet we work with many doctors around the country and around the world, so we wanted a tool, sorry about that, that to, to deliver to them. So this is a web-based tool, and if you refer a patient to the Cleveland Clinic, you can sign up for this service, and it will make the information available to you. So when the patient comes to the front desk, and this is why the tool, it was important for scheduling and registration to be connected, when they walk to the front desk and check in, the computer knows that that patient is related to a referring physician who has this system. The registrar asks the patient, would you like this information to be shared with that physician? If they say yes, they click the button, and that physician gets an email, a generic email, telling them that they should go into this DR Connect system because their patient is being serviced at the Cleveland Clinic. If they go in, it will tell them when they arrived, what desk they're at, what physician they're going to see, and then they see everything that's done for related to that patient's care uh, inside of the system. They also see the images in that same way. No additional plug-in they can view. But this is view only because these are not employed Cleveland Clinic physicians. Uh, and credentialing wouldn't allow you to do it for someone that you're not directly related to. This is our fastest growing system. We have about half of these physicians that are now inside of Ohio, and then the other half are either national or international. It works everywhere. Back on the patient side, as we started to move down this road, 
We know that we needed to engage patients. We needed to provide them with professional services. But the other thing we needed was to gather information from them, real physiologic information to manage their care. But most importantly, information from right now, not from a week ago, not from a month ago. But if you're going to make a real, timely, valuable clinical decision, now is what we're talking about. So we have two versions of this. We call it My Monitoring. Um, this, is, this portion is also an add-on feature. The DR Connect is not. That's core to the product. So we did build this capability. At the high end, it's for implanted medical devices, insulin pumps, pacemakers like this one, um, brain stimulators. They're all computers. They all tell you something about the device itself and they will tell you something about the physiologic state of the patient. So here um, we uh, use this service. Someone comes in, they see the surgeon, they have the pacemaker implanted. They go to see the cardiologist, and the cardiologist now says, what level of service would you like? You can have traditional, which means you go for four visits a year to have this device assessed. Um, or they now call it the OnStar version. I don't know if that means anything up here, um, but um, it's the OnStar version of this where you can do it three times virtually and once come in physically. It opens a two-week window. Any time during that two-week window, the person can log on to their computer and effectively they are uploading their information but the key to us is it goes into the same EMR to the same place where they expect uh, to see that information so that they can then care for the patient. Now the last thing I would say, and I'm gonna wrap up with a quick story, is that now we're at the stage where interoperability is incredibly important. Because up until now, it's been a Cleveland Clinic-centric view of the world, and now what we want to do is really start thinking about any patient anywhere. Uh, so uh, this is the bleeding edge, I think they call it, and uh, we've been on it many times. So we did the original Google Health um, uh, program, didn't go so well. Um, we are live on this Health Vault exchange model. We do the state-based interoperability program. We're in the federal um, program. There's a nationwide health information network in the states that we're a part of. And essentially, we have a, a toe in every pond, if you will, waiting for the marketplace to tell us what's the successful one, and that's the one we will use. Um, so private sector ones appear to be developing there, principally driven by big footprints like this, or by the, the telcos are really getting into this market. You can kind of see Apple there at the edge, but they're really more device oriented, I would say, than true interoperability suppliers. Um, so we use this tool um, today. So it is a, uh, an active tool. I mentioned the nationwide health information network, our state health information exchange, and then this is the private sector one. A patient controls this, so they sign up for the service. That gets rid of all the confidentiality challenges that we have. They're driving the bus. They collect the information into their health vault account from their local community, their local doctor, their local pharmacy, their local hospital, and then they make the decision to push it to the Cleveland Clinic. And then from there, we can then make it available in that same EMR. So let me just end with a little story that I think ties the whole thing together and I think shows the value of the combination of the tools and interoperability to getting back to this point of changing the way we're gonna deliver care and doing it in a cost-effective way. So everything I'm gonna show you is active today with one exception and I'll point that out when I get there, but I had to make the story work. Um, so here, I have a patient in Southwest United States that we don't know. They went online because they had a primary diagnosis and they wanted a second opinion from the Cleveland Clinic. They weren't going to travel 1,500 miles just for the second opinion. So instead, they sent electrons and some physical documents to us. We used that tool as I described to you earlier and then we communicated back with that individual online. So in this case, the patient decides that um, they, it, it, it really is a heart repair, valve repair that you want. 
If you're going to have that, you probably should be willing to travel. There are five or six places that I would recommend to go and have that done. And so this patient decides that they are going to do it and they're going to come to Cleveland. So what we say to them is before you ever come, we'd like this to be as, if, as effective a process for you, a great experience, and we want our clinicians to be as knowledgeable about you as they possibly can be. So we ask the patient to sign up for two things. One, one of those interoperability services, in this case it's Health Vault, and then the second is we ask them to sign up the local physician who's going to care for them for that DR Connect service. Uh, because they're not moving to Cleveland, we know that, and we want that physician to be involved in the care. So that's what the patient does here. That's the literal Health Vault account that they set up. They then pull information in from these local services and they put it into that account. They then say inside of the Health Vault service, we, I want to move this information to the Cleveland Clinic. There's essentially an A-B switch in there and they, po they point that pointer and it puts the information into our EMR in this structured fashion. So now the clinicians can review it and they can make the decision about whether or not uh, there's any additional testing that needs to be done. The most cost effective place to do that testing is in their hometown, not when they get to Cleveland when we have the OR already scheduled for them. So our goal is to make sure they arrive and if they are going to need this procedure, we know enough about them that we could take them directly to the OR if it's the appropriate thing to do. Now there's only so much you can do virtually and eventually the patient's going to actually have to come to Cleveland for that surgery. Uh, when they arrive in Cleveland, the, all of our doctors are using that EMR that I described and all of the other clinicians. And so as a result of that, their physician back in their hometown can see everything that's happening. And if they want, they can see it minute by minute. If they're in an ambulatory setting, they see everything that's happening. If they're in the inpatient setting, they see it. If they go to the OR, they see it. Every order, every result, every x-ray, they can review and be a virtual part of the team. So now we're ready to discharge the patient. The surgery went well. So since we are going to be a member of that person's healthcare team over time, we ask the patient to sign up for this MyChart account. Uh, so now they have access to that information directly. They don't have to go through the Health Vault service. So this is the part I made up. So I wanted this patient to recuperate, so we sent him to sunny Florida, great beach and all that stuff down there. It's nice and warm. Um, but really what we have the capability of doing, but we just haven't done it yet, is actually remotely monitoring that patient. So a blood pressure cuff, a scale, post-surgery, uh, we can do it. We, we've done it from patients' homes. We've never done it from a hotel yet that we're aware of anyway, um, where we can actually gather that information and do that monitoring by the team back in Cleveland that is partially responsible for their care. Now, ultimately, the patient is going to go back home, but here's the difference when they get there. They have a fundamentally different expectation. And that expectation is that information about their care is available both to their clinicians and to them. That second, that they have a healthcare team that is not defined by geography uh, because we can use the power of information and use the power of interoperability uh, to bring that team together. And they have the comfort of knowing that that team has them as the focus of their activity as they go forward. So what I would say is that as I think about what the opportunities really are for delivering very high value cost effective care, it is absolutely tied to the challenges that we're all working on from a health information technology point of view and an interoperability point of view. We must actively engage patients in this process and we need to make them um, active decision makers and make sure that they're empowered in the care process. Uh, the more engaged they are, the better the outcomes are going to be and the better the experience is going to be. And then finally, if we truly want to shift the cost curve, we have to do two things. We need to engage more people earlier 
and keep them healthier longer. That's what really bends the cost curve uh, going forward. But for those that are ill, we have the opportunity of delivering real high quality medical services for a patient at any time, anywhere they need it. Thank you.